Okay, chapter 22, The Ordeal of Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. This deals with the aftermath of the Civil War and what to do with both the, the southern states and do we treat them like conquered territories? Do we treat them like you know, like a dispute among friends that's over? How, how do we deal with that? And that, that causes a lot of problems. And then what do we do with the millions of uh, freedmen? Now we don't call them slaves anymore, we call them freedmen. And, and what do we do with them? As far as treating the Confederates like prisoners, like enemies of the state, like war criminals, that really was debated for you know the first couple of years or so after the Civil War. Eventually, though, um, they're all pardoned. So all the rebel leaders are pardoned by President Johnson in 1868. And it was basically meant to be a gesture of peace, uh, a Christmas present. It was done right around Christmas. And it was a recognition that the South needed major work. Here you can see this is a picture of Charleston down at the bottom. And you can see there's there's basically nothing left. Atlanta was burned to the ground. Richmond. I mean, all the major cities in the South were destroyed. And remember, there weren't a whole lot of cities to begin with. In addition to that, a lot of the plantations were burned to the ground. So I mean, the, there's just devastation. In addition to devastation, the South lost their entire investment. Remember, whereas in the North, people invested in you know early versions of the stock market, but in factories, in property and stuff like that. In the South, if you had money, you invested in slaves. And with the abolition of slavery, that's it. You lost your investment. So... The South had no money, and a, a huge portion of the population was dead. And what do you do? First thing we have to figure out is, what do you do with the freedmen? It's kind of, you know, I don't know why it's tested so much, but it is. And it's kind of grafted onto this chapter. But during the 1870s, which technically isn't even in this, this time period for this chapter, although it's in this chapter, uh, 25,000 blacks from the south, Louisiana, Texas, and Mississippi, they move on their own to Kansas. And they do so almost like a, a second Great Awakening utopian uh, community movement. So remember when we talked about the Shakers, the Oneida community, um, the, the Mormons and stuff like that? Well, the blacks have their own kind of somewhat movement during this time period. And they moved to Kansas, and they tried to create their own uh, community to be free from, you know, the white uh, domination, I guess. And it, it didn't really work. Um, what did work for the black community is church. They, they formed their own churches, and that really becomes the central focus of the black community. Um, that That's where all of the, you know, the, the early forms of social welfare, uh, education and just the community spirit is built in this, these community churches. And this is a picture of an early um, black community. Now, what do the northerners, remember those abolitionists like uh, William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, um, who were very, very militant uh, abolitionists. They weren't crazy, right? Uh, but they what did they do now that the slaves are free? Well, they they figured out that they still their their job's not done yet, and the reason why it's not done yet is because the freedmen they didn't lack or they didn't have any skills, right? I mean they they were and oftentimes bred to pick cotton, and that is a, a manual labor skill, and that's it. And there were laws that prohibited them from learning how to read and write and stuff like that. They obviously had no property. So what you have is these these millions of people with no money, no property, uh, and no skills. And so Congress creates the Freedmen's Bureau in 1865, and it was intended to be a primitive welfare agency. So it would provide the basics of of food and clothing, really really rudimentary medical care. Cause they really had only rudimentary medical care back then. But the most important thing, though, and the most successful thing that the Freedmen's Bureau did was education. They taught 
hundreds of thousands of freedmen how to read. And remember that what the we talked about was the worst part of slavery is being separated from your families. So in the aftermath of the Civil War, you have all these slaves who are trying to find lost loved ones. And that's basically impossible to do unless you can read. And so there's this big push by both the Freedmen and the Freedmen's Bureau of literacy, trying to learn how to read so that you could post basically want ads in the, in the classified sections of the newspaper saying, I'm looking for my husband. His name is Robert Bob. Um, and so the people would read them so that they could try and re reconnect. Now, here's the problem, though. Just like anything else in government, you get shady people involved in government. And so local administrators often collaborated with the plantation elites in the South. And they kind of used the Freedmen's Bureau as a front, an, an operation to kind of try and trick the, the freedmen into signing labor contracts uh, and, of course, to, to work for their former masters. And that's really the, the big tragedy about the, the Reconstruction is that in 1870, your typical black guy is doing the exact same thing in the exact same clothes, with the exact same tools, surrounded by the exact same people uh, that he was doing in 1860. For the same people now. Instead of uh, the white guy being his master, now it's his employer or his landlord. Then we got this little cartoon from uh, the book. That's supposed to be a Andrew Johnson. I don't know if he's a midget or what, but uh, there he is. He's handling the books above his capacity. So in other words, you know, the Constitution was was bigger than him, and this is the result. He's crushed by it. Andrew Johnson becomes one of two American presidents to ever be impeached. We're going to start off. There are three plans of Reconstruction. The first one is done while President Lincoln is still alive. And it's called the 10% plan. It's the easiest. It's the most friendly of the plans. So despite the fact that President Lincoln uh, was the president during the Civil War, he was also the most friendly towards the South in the aftermath of the Civil War. And is articulated in the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction on December 8th, 1863. So the war still had a couple years to go. But, you know, we had conquered Tennessee and some other states. And so it was, they wanted back into the Union. Of course, Lincoln didn't consult Congress at all during Reconstruction. He really didn't consult Congress much at all for, for any of his things in the war. Uh, and here's his plan. He's going to pardon all but the highest-ranking military and civilian Confederate officers. Remember, this point is moot because everybody was pardoned in 1868, but this is five years before that. The meat of this plan is at the very bottom there. When 10% of the voting population in the 1860 election take an oath of loyalty and they establish a new government, it will be recognized. So this is very easy. So all you have to do is basically have 10% of the people in the state who agree to... Uh, not be rebels anymore, and then they form a new state government. If they do this, then they their state comes back into the Union as if it never left. Here's the problem, though. The Republicans in Congress, and also some of the more uh, militant Republicans around the, the nation, they feared that there would be a restoration of the planter aristocracy. And you know what? They probably were correct. The, the reason why... Um, they didn't really get a chance to fight Lincoln too much on this, is because the war was still going on when President Lincoln's plan, and then President Lincoln is assassinated so soon after the war that the other states, the deeper states, the states that were still in rebellion, they didn't have a chance to go through this. But uh, there definitely would have been some fighting, and I, I think it's, you know, you can play the what-if game in history, but it's a distinct possibility that Lincoln himself probably would have been impeached during his second term. So, in 1864, <clears throat> three Lincoln governments were formed under the 10% plan, Louisiana, Tennessee, and Arkansas. Um, they were very, very weak. And because the, the war was still going on, they really depended on the occupying Northern Army for their survival completely. So they were, you know, they, it was almost like when the United States was in Iraq. In 2000, they're still fighting, you know, Fallujah and stuff like that, which still belong to the enemy. 
and yet we kind of controlled Baghdad, and that was about it. So what's going on in Congress, though? In Congress, you have, especially these two guys, Senator Benjamin Wade and Congressman Henry Davis, both Republicans, but most of Congress is Republicans, right? The Democrats are the ones that were the secessionists. Uh, then you had the Unionists, who were some Southerners and Northerners who also wanted um, the, the war to end. But then you had these hardcore Republicans who were very, very anti-South. And they did not like Abraham Lincoln's plan at all. So what they wanted to do was they have a much harsher version of Reconstruction. And so they pushed through Congress. It's called the Wade Davis Bill in 1864. And they upped it from 10% to 50%. And it was that an oath, another oath. This oath was called an ironclad oath, though. Because whereas the other ones, uh, and under Lincoln's plans, just said, oh, yeah, we'll follow the Constitution from now on. This one, 50% had to take an oath saying that they had never voluntarily aided the rebellion. What this does is it would preclude anybody who fought in the Civil War for the South or led the Civil War in the South from ever taking part in government. In addition to that, they required a state constitutional convention before the election of state officials. So almost like they would betray like a territory coming in again, where the territory had to create their own convention, write up their own um, constitution and stuff like that. And they also wanted to have specific safeguards uh, for freedmen's liberties. So what does Lincoln do? The bill comes to him, and he puts it in his pocket, as they say, and pocket vetoes it. And here's how the pocket veto works. If the Congress turns in uh, a bill to the president to sign into law, and it, there's, uh, I can't remember the exact details, but usually they procrastinate just like you guys, and they pass a bunch of bills the last week that they're in session. If the president signs them, they become law. If after, and I want to say it's 10 days, two weeks, something like that, if he doesn't sign it, then it still becomes law. However, if Congress goes out of session in the interim between the time that he gets it and that 10 to 14 days, which happens a lot, then it's called pocket vetoing, that the bill never becomes a law. And so when the new Congress comes in in two, three months, uh, they, they have to redo everything. They have to start from scratch. And so that's what Lincoln does. He pocket vetoes this bill. So it never becomes law. Then he... Abraham Lincoln's killed, right? So, who comes in? Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson, uh, for the most part, adopts Lincoln's plan, although he added a, a couple more harsher measures. So this would be the second of the three Reconstruction plans, and we're, we're increasing in its harshness towards the South. So, first bullet point there, offers amnesty upon a simple oath to all, except Confederate civil and military officers, and those with property over $20,000. So basically, the, the military elite and the rich could not uh, take the oath. However, they could apply to the president for a specific part. You're just asking for corruption here. All right, rich people, you don't get to get in unless you specifically come to me for a pardon. And what do rich people do with their money? Well, they're going to they're gonna bribe them, right? Also, in the new constitutions, they must accept a minimum conditions repudiating slavery, secession, and state debts, uh, name provisional governors in Confederate states, and call them to oversee elections for constitutional conventions. What were the effects of his plan? It gets rid of certain leading Confederates, pardon the planter elites, but brings them back into state control, and pisses off the Republicans. So just like Wade and Davis got pissed off at uh, uh, Lincoln's plan, they also get pissed off at Johnson's plan. Remember, they didn't like Johnson to begin with because he was a Southerner, right? I mean, he was he was a closet Democrat. He was under a Unionist under what their what they called themselves at that time. The South. So now we're in the aftermath of the Civil War. You know, for whatever reason, they didn't act like they were defeated. And so they just kind of thumb their noses at these northern requirements. And so many of the southern state constitutions fell short. Johnson granted 13,500 special pardons. So you can imagine uh, the south, they're slowly getting more and more power. 
and uh, the the Republicans are getting more and more angry at this. A revival of Southern Defiance and the Black Codes. So we had the slave codes uh, during the antebellum time period, right? Slaves couldn't own guns, or they couldn't use guns, they couldn't read, they couldn't write, they couldn't be, uh, you know, together after hours on the road, you know, just a bunch of stupid stuff like that. Um, well, the South passes a bunch of black codes now, racist laws uh, that that hurt the freedmen. These are the there's a table from your book talking about the Reconstruction plans. You got Lincoln's plan there, 1864-1865. Then you got Johnson's. Um, then we're going to talk about congressional plans uh, in a couple minutes. But you can see there, there's the congressional plan, 10% plan with the 14th Amendment. And then Congress goes hardcore from 1867 to 1877. We'll talk about that. Okay, so the black codes. Back to the black codes. These were lo The laws were designed to regulate the affairs of the emancipated blacks. Uh, it's, it's a direct quote from your book. What it's meant to do, though, is to punish the blacks for the sole, their nature of being black and to force them back into the same jobs as they were before. So I have here is aimed to ensure a stable and subservient labor force. There were very, very big penalties for blacks who broke their labor contracts. And remember, they were kind of forced into these labor, labor contracts. So they forfeited their back wages. They could be forcibly dragged back into work by a Negro catcher. It's basically just a slave catcher who you know, redoes, uh, <laughs> just, just changes his business card and does the exact same thing. In Mississippi, a captured freeman could be fined. So he could be arrested. He's fined. And of course he doesn't have money to pay this. So then they would hire him out to pay the fine. And of course, who are they hiring him out to pay this fine? His old master. They also sought uh, to restore the traditional race relations of whites on top and blacks on the bottom. So blacks were barred from serving on juries, renting or leasing land, and they were punished for not having a job. They would be punished for idleness was the, the crime uh, by being forced to, to work on a chain gang. And of course they had no right to vote. So if you are a black person with not a whole lot of skills other than you know the ability to pick cotton, what do you do? Remember, it's illegal for you not to have a job. So you become a sharecropper. Right? And a sharecropper is now you're doing the same thing as you did before. So here's what sharecropping looked like. You have the furnishing merchant. This oftentimes was the land owner himself, was the plantation owner, was the former master. He would loan tools and seed up to 60% interest, right? That's ridiculously high, to the tenant farmer. The tenant farmer would be the black person to plant a spring crop. Okay, The tenant farmer then harvests the those crops in autumn and then he has to turn over right, a bunch of the stuff to the landowner who's still the furnishing merchant. So you can see here it's a vicious circle, and it's meant to, to keep the, the tenant farmer deeper and deeper into debt. Because remember, he gets all his tools, all his seed, all his land, his house, his clothing, other stuff, all on credit from the merchant until the harvest. right? And then he turns over a portion of that harvest to the landowner. He also is forced to sell right to the landowner himself too so it just keeps it, it's it's a system set in place to to force the the sharecropper to become deeper and deeper into debt so he can never leave and he can never do anything else he's, he's essentially a slave again this is a picture from your book of now sharecroppers so does this look any different than pictures you saw from before from the 1850s of slavery. Sharecropping, how prevalent was it? We have here a percentage of sharecrop farms by county. And you can see here in the south. Um, and you could actually, what I should have done, is should have overlaid a demographics of where African Americans lived in the south. And it's almost identical to you know, the, these darker, I don't know, red pinkish areas here where there was black people there was sharecropping 
So under these 10% plus uh, plans, a number of states uh, come back into the union. And then their congressmen, they show up in Washington, D.C. And the northern congressmen basically say, no, screw you, you're not getting in. So they just they just flat out deny admittance into Congress. Uh, they also then com- create a joint committee on Reconstruction, and this joint committee is basically going to say we're going to you know disregard the president's plan and we are going to take over Reconstruction. At the end of the day, Reconstruction becomes a fight between the legislative branch and the executive branch as to who gets to control this, and it. You know, this kind of makes sense, really, that this fight would occur, because in the Constitution, there's nothing regarding which branch of the government gets to control a post-Civil War uh, readmittance legality issues. And obviously, Lincoln and Johnson you know, took first crack at it, that the executive branch got to control it, and it took the legislative branch a little bit more time, but... Uh, you know, they'd finally decide in 1866, no, screw you, President. It's it's Congress's job to do this. And it turns into an all right, outright war. So what does the President do in response? Well, he vetoes the, the new Freedmen's Bureau bill, and he also vetoes uh, a Civil Rights Act. And here you can see this is a, a picture from your book of President Johnson uh, kicking the Freedmen's Bureau. Get it, Bureau? It's uh, furniture, and all the tiny little black people are getting uh, crushed or getting launched out. So it's a, kind of a politically incorrect uh, cartoon there. But what does Congress do? They pass both these bills over Johnson's veto. Now, for the Constitution test, we talked about how you, how Congress can, you know, a, a check. Well, a check on Congress is to veto their legislation, and then a counter check is to overturn uh, their veto. Well, here's the deal. It had never been done. This is the first time in American history, in, what are we at, like 80 years of American history, this is the first time that Congress had overturned a presidential veto. And they do it twice. Yeah, I think they were within weeks of each other. So then Congress like, screw you, President, we're taking over. So they pass a new, well, this is the Civil Rights Bill, right, that we talked about. And it conferred citizenship on blacks. So it said the blacks are citizens. So this then overturns the Dred Scott decision, all that other stuff that we talked about before. And it also attacks some of the black coats, not all of them. However, they were worried that once these guys in the South that they had kept from coming to Washington, D.C., once they finally got into D.C., that they would overturn the civil rights law. Remember that they knew the president didn't like it already. So they turned the civil rights law of 1866 into the 14th Amendment. And so it's really the same type of language that's in this ordinary law they turned into part of the Constitution. So here's the the details of the 14th Amendment. When we get to next year in AP government, uh, you know, we're going to talk a lot about the 14th Amendment because it's so important for other things, including the incorporation doctrine and some other things regarding the Bill of Rights. But for for US history purposes, you know, think Friedman Right, and think Southern uh, re-assimilation into the Union. So it conferred civil rights, including citizenship, on freedom. Basically said, you know, if you're if you're born here, you're a citizen, regardless of race. Reduced the proportionality, the representation of a state and Congress in the Electoral College if it denied blacks the ballot. So if Southerners uh, denied the right to vote to blacks, remember this is this is prior to the Fifteenth Amendment, then they lost representation in college or in college in uh, Congress and the Electoral College. It also disqualified former federal and state office from former Confederates who, as federal office ho- holders, had violated their oath. So, in other words, uh, members of Congress in 1860 or the federal government who you know had previously taken an oath to uphold the Constitution, then uh, it, why did, if, if they seceded? Um, they should be precluded from, you know, coming back and having another job in the union. Uh, and of course, it guaranteed the federal debt and repudiated the Confederate debts. So it said that the United States government will pay the union debt, but it won't pay the Confederate debt. This is just a picture from your book: uh, Republicans campaigning in Louisiana. 
uh, nothing special there. Okay, so the the South then gets basically attacked by the the Republicans in Congress, who want a much harsher Reconstruction, and so they pass the Military Reconstruction Act, and it basically it's a reboot. So all the entire South, they're on reconstructed or unassimilated again so they have to start from scratch if they refuse to ratify the 14th amendment so it's basically ratify this amendment or you're you're back out civil wars back on essentially and it divides these 10 unreconstructed states into five military districts and you can see that the graphic down there at the bottom <clears throat> And you'd have northern soldiers occupying, and you'd have military generals as the, the the essentially the governors. So you can see here, General Sheridan controls District Number Five, General Ord, General Pope, General Sickles, General Schofield. Um, the only one that was able to escape this forced reconstruction was Tennessee, because remember, really already in 1863 they're back in the fold. This is just a, a table from your book that talks about when the states finally get back into um, the Union, because at the end of the day, Military Reconstruction Act is the one that prevails. Uh, Congress wins this battle between the president and the, the legislative branch. You can see Tennessee avoids it because they ratified the 14th Amendment right away. You don't get to these states right here, right? Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina, I mean, they they hold out to the absolute end and it becomes this kind of corrupt bargain remember how uh, uh, John Quincy Adams had the corrupt bargain of 1824 there's another corrupt bargain in the 1876 election that results in Rutherford B. Hayes becoming president in 1877 which we'll talk about not today okay so what's going on in the south though so you know the the 15th amendment is eventually passed given black people the right to vote and in many areas, black people are the majority. And with northern soldiers protecting them, they vote. They vote a lot. And so much to the southern dismay, uh, between 1868 and 1876, 14 black congressmen and two black senators actually uh, are elected to the highest offices in the land in uh, Washington, D.C. The white southerners absolutely hate this system. And they also hate the whites who helped set up this system and so southerners who were um, former unionists or whigs uh, they were called scallywags and then northerners who came down after the war to work in the freedmen's bureau and stuff like that they were called carpetbaggers because they basically took everything with them in a carpet bag and uh, you know they accused the, the northerners of seeking personal power and profit this is a picture from your book of Friedman voting. Very exciting. Okay, the KKK. So, you know, I talked about that the whites in the South hated the system. And so they formed the KKK. It's founded in Tennessee in 1866. And what they do is, you know, they, they start with the lynching. And we're going to talk a lot about lynching uh, in the next few weeks or so. But the first wave of lynchings was actually directed towards the scallywags and the carpetbaggers. The first 10 years of uh, Reconstruction, more whites were lynched than, than blacks. Once the Southerners come back into power in the South, starting in the 1870s or so, that's when they shift their focus then towards uh, abusing uh, black people. But... What does Congress do? Congress passes the Force Acts of 1870-1871 to try and police and attack the KKK. And you know you don't need to know the details, but for to a certain measure they were successful, and the KKK uh, diminishes in power for a little while there. But again, once the Southern states, Southern Confederate leaders come back into power, uh, oftentimes a lot of them were members of the KKK. It rises in power, and it was a very powerful organization for decades and decades. One of the, the less violent ways that Southerners used to prohibit uh, black people from exercising their 15th Amendment right to vote is they used uh, things called literacy tests and poll taxes. So before you got to vote you had to pass a literacy test and you know obviously if, if it was illegal 
uh, to learn how to read or write as a slave, uh, a lot of African Americans had difficulty with these literacy tests. Now the poor whites, on the other hand, who also couldn't read or write, they would be coached. Uh, they would be helped by whoever was administering the test, and the same person would not help a black person. Poll tax, you got to pay a, you know, a, a fee. And if you're an African American who's constantly in debt thanks to the sharecropping system, uh, you're screwed, right? You're not going to be able to pay this tax. So if you can't vote, then you can't vote in black people or pro-black people. And uh, then uh, you, know, you can see what's, what's going to happen in the South. This is an early photo uh, from your book of a member of the KKK. So you didn't have, they didn't have the fancy uh, white hats or nothing like that yet, but I mean they eventually get there. And they're supposed to be, their, their get-up was supposed to be the ghosts of dead Confederate soldiers who were basically seeking their vengeance on uh, Southerners who betrayed them and the blacks who betrayed them and all this other nonsense. This is racist BS. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about Johnson's impeachment now. We're going to talk about Slick Willie's impeachment from the 1990s uh, a couple months from now, but for now it's time to talk Andrew Johnson. So Congress is trying to get rid of this president that they hate. So they passed the Tenure of Office Act, and the details are the president could not remove any officials, especially cabinet members, without the Senate's consent, if the position originally required the Senate's approval. Right? So, you know, you pick a guy to be Secretary of State, cabinet official, and then the Senate is supposed to confirm it. Right? They're supposed to give their consent and say yes. Okay. Now, under the Tenure of Office Act, you can't get rid of that Secretary of State then without the approval of. Uh, uh, of that same Senate. And so Andrew Johnson, his cabinet is made up of a bunch of Lincoln guys, right? And so they they wanted to protect members of the Lincoln government. And they had an ally in Edward Stanton there, the picture on the right. Now, there's nothing in the Constitution that, that has anything about this, right? So, you know, this is of questionable nature. And it's meant really to harm some so, of course, Johnson removes Secretary, I believe Stanton was the Secretary of War at the time, um, in February 1868. And, you know, he knew he was violating the, the Tenure of Office Act. And Stanton was engaging in, I don't want to say treasonous behavior, but he was, you know, he was undercutting everything Johnson did. He was trying to get fired. He was trying to do this so that they could have a reason to impeach Johnson. So, Johnson also replaced generals in the field who were more sympathetic uh, to, to radical reconstruction. And so the House impeaches him, right? But they impeach him before he's even indicted, which is kind of funny, uh, on a vote of 126 to 47. So you can see what's going on here in the House of Representatives. It is they are out for blood. So before he's officially, even the charges are brought up, they already vote to impeach him. Boom, done. Then it goes to the Senate. So the House under the Constitution has the power to impeach, and the Senate conducts the trial. And you can see here at the bottom right, they actually issued tickets. Uh, tickets to impeachment of the president, amidst the bear. And, you know, this was the, the trial of the century, right? There's a trial of the century, well, approximately every year or two. And it was an 11-week trial. How it, it, it was almost three months, I don't know. Um... And you need two thirds to convict to kick him out of office, and Johnson was acquitted. There was one vote short of the requisite 36 votes uh, to convict him. So he gets to remain the president, but let's face it, uh, he's a president in name only for the rest of his tenure. Uh, when you're this close to impeachment, uh, that's it. You're done. I mean, you're you're beyond a lame duck. All right, and the, the you know thing that's kind of grafted onto this chapter just because the same time period is Alaska. This is when we get Alaska. The Russians uh, had just got done with the Crimean War with Britain, and it didn't go well for them at all. And they wanted to get rid of Alaska, right? Most of the Russians actually live in in Europe, right, west of the Ural Mountains, and then there's Siberia, which almost nobody lives in, and then even East of Siberia is Alaska, and so they didn't want it anymore. Um, remember, Canada was owned by Britain at the time, 
and so they didn't want to provoke another fight with Britain, but they didn't want to give Alaska to Britain also. And they also kind of felt it was furred out, meaning that they had all the good hunting uh, of beaver and whatnot had already been uh, done in Alaska. So they wanted to unload it on somebody else besides Britain. And that was us. And so in 1867, Secretary of State William Seward bought Alaska for $7.2 million total. That is a, a ridiculous deal. Uh, fortunately for Seward, and you can see here that the size of Alaska superimposed over the rest of the country, you know, it almost increases our country by you know a quarter, uh, just Alaska. It it was called Seward's Folly and Seward's Icebox because there's nothing up there. It, you know, we were deep in debt in the aftermath of the Civil War, so the last thing people thought is that we needed to dump another seven million dollars on something that nobody lived in. You know, right by the North Pole. Uh, and it, of course, it turns into, you know, aside from the Louisiana Purchase, probably the best land deal America ever made. Uh, it was, there's so many natural resources there, uh, and just the, the amount of acreage that we got. And, and then when the, the Cold War hits, and it turns into a very military strategic place uh, that we're able to launch uh, bombers and spy planes and stuff like that. Uh, to, to keep an eye on our Soviet brethren. It becomes very, very important. And the last slide of the lecture. This one's not bad, under 40 minutes. We got 1863, Lincoln announces the 10% Reconstruction Plan. He vetoes the Wade Davis Bill in 1864. 1865, he's assassinated. Takes one to the head. Um, Johnson issues his Reconstruction Proclamation. Congress refuses to cede Southern congressmen. You get the Freedmen's Bureau. You start to get the Black Coats. Big, big year in 1865. 1866, they overturn Johnson's veto. They pass the 14th Amendment. Uh, you get the KKK is founded. You get then 1867, Congress takes over Reconstruction with the third plan, the, the harshest of the three plans, and they pass the Reconstruction Act, the Tenure of Office Act that purchased Alaska. 1868, Johnson is impeached and acquitted. He also pardons the Confederate leaders. That's actually where, how we started this lecture. The 15th Amendment is ratified in 1870. We kind of talked about it a little bit here and there. And uh, the Freedmen's Bureau ends in 1872. And 1877, we also alluded to this reconstruction, will end. We'll talk about that more uh, later.